Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome Good morning. to our meeting today. A particular welcome to Victor, who's going to bring us God's word later on. It being summer, most things are stood down for the midweek, but there are still those chances to be meeting and supporting each other informally. A particular reminder about the men's curry night, which is Friday the 26th. Right. Papa six. Fantastic. If you haven't signed up and you're a man and you'd like to gather curry, do please get in touch with Steve. And a bit of advance notice for a week Wednesday. Don't turn up this Wednesday, you'll be on your own. But Wednesday the 17th, after Julie's barbecue, if you can move, then we've been invited to go across to St. Joseph's in Benelon and to meet them for their prayer meeting at 7.45. Matthew will be giving a bit of a reminder of where Hope Church is, what we're doing, and we're all invited to go along. There's usually about 15 to 30 of them. We'll be one button. They were intending to pray for us anyway, and it's a great chance to give them a bit of evidence of what they are praying for. So, 1945, a week on Wednesday. Now, as we're going to see in Psalm 3, God sustains and protects his people for eternity, no matter what the threat and how hopeless things might be seeming in this world. But we're here to remind each other of that great news. Certain hope of life with God for all who trust in the work of his living word, Jesus. Because the phrase life-changing would have been used a lot in the last couple of weeks. You have seen the couple of words, 3.6 million, and their version of life-changing was a new back scratcher. <laughs> Or for the footballers who say things have been life-changing by virtue of their Euro win. But it's Jesus alone who offers the prospect of changing lives forever. Because the money gets spent, we all get older and trainer, but Jesus has an eternal life. I'm going to pray now, we're going to focus our minds on him as we open our time together. Now, when we've got regular prayers, it's so easy personally speaking, to switch our minds off and to just read the words. So I've filled on with the words for the opening prayer, and as we look at the other prayers, let's concentrate a lot on the God they reveal, not just reading them. Let's have a look at the words together. Dear Lord, thank you for being with us and in all ways. Help us as we meet to be honest about the ways we have let you down, to know you better through your word, to show our need for you in our prayers, and to give you the glory you deserve in everything we do together. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So this morning we're going to be looking at Psalm 3 where David takes confidence from God's presence, and we also have God with us this morning, whatever our circumstances. So to rejoice in that now, as we stand to sing the words of our first song, Be Thou My Vision.
Because the great news is that God is our high king of heaven. And Jesus has won us an inheritance which is kept there. He loved and he died for us while we were still his enemies. And he knows everything about us, including everything that we're so relieved is private. The things that we know of ourselves that don't give God the glory. We need to bring those things to God now and turn away from them, not because that doing so will save us, but because he has saved us. Let's join in the words of the confession and then remind ourselves of our rescue as we share the words of the creed, the things that we believe and hold on to as central. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you, the right of us, in thought, word, and deed, and in what we have left undone. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and help us to serve you in the nearness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. As we respond to the confession, we've got Psalm 32, which explains the forgiveness that we have from God. Have a look at the words of Psalm 32. We're going to read the first five verses, and just to think about the wonder of further on in the Psalms, the acknowledgement of the true forgiveness that David has. You're very welcome to join in these words with me. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and in whose spirit is no deceit. And when I kept silent, my bones wasted away, through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me, my strength was sapped, as in the heat of the summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Lord God, we thank you for the peace you have won for all those who trust in your work for them through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Amen. 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 Well, this is great news of forgiveness for us all, so let's stand in the light of this and join together in the words of the creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please have a seat. The wonderful truth are that we can be absolutely assured that through life, Christ's life, death, and resurrection, that we have a hope. A hope that we can depend on, a hope that's for eternity. Lindsay is now going to bring us the next section of the theology. Sorry. I'm going to start off with a question. So what have these pictures got in common to shut up when you think you know what they've got in common? The phones? Communication. So that's not phone. Any other Messages on the occasion. Yeah. That's right. 
So Steve, what do you think they're helping with? Yeah. So they're a way of getting a message to someone, aren't they? They're a way of talking to someone. What about this? Is that a way of talking to someone? So what's going on here? Right. right. Yeah, that's right. But what's going on in terms of who's talking to who? Somebody talking to God. Yeah. So that's how we talk to God, isn't it? And what about this? Is anybody talking to anybody there? Yeah. Margaret? <laughs> Yeah, that's right. That's it. So the, to the topic of the Ology book today is that um, God talks to us and we talk to God. So we talk to God in prayer and he speaks to us through his word in the Bible. And Helen told us um, that just as Jake told Isabella what to draw, God told people what to write down in the Bible. <coughs> And unlike Marion, who tells great big porcupines about going to the North Pole, <laughs> God never lies, and his word is written down in the Bible, is true. God's word in the Bible takes the shape of lots of different literary forms, doesn't it? It's written in different styles. There's law, and there's songs, and poetry, and history books. And this narrative that tells us all those true stories that we know and we love, and some we don't know so well as well. But because the Bible is the way that God speaks to us, it's not just information or culture or literature. It speaks to us now, in the situations that we find ourselves, in the context of our world today. So it's instruction and wisdom and discipline. Try the Bible before you buy any self-help books that are so crucial to the internet. It's comfort when we face hardship. It's a place of refuge and hope when it's all getting too much for us. It's where we can find joy and delight that we are valued and loved, whatever we like. And it speaks peace to our hearts because we know from it that God is sovereign over all. The Bible is a love letter from God to us, explaining how he has provided for all our needs. And of course, ultimately, it's where we will find how to be forgiven for our sin and saved for eternity. By the Holy Spirit, the Father uses the passages of the Bible to talk to us in all of our circumstances. So what about our reply? We reply to God in prayer. And we can say thank you for all of those things that he does for us and has done for us. The Bible talks a lot about praying, about us talking to God. And it tells us we can talk to God anywhere and everywhere. And you don't have to have your eyes closed, you can't. We can talk to God all the time. And we can talk to God about anything in our hearts. The Bible says we're to pour out our hearts to him and he will heal us. In Psalm 62, it says, Trust God all the time. Tell him all your problems, because God is our protection. The Gospel writers felt it was really important for us to know that Jesus prayed a lot. A lot. They told us that he went off on his own to pray all the time. And it made them wonder whether they were doing it right, and whether they were saying the right things. So they said to Jesus, tell us how to pray. What should we say to God? And you know the answer to that. Jesus taught them the Lord's Prayer. So shall we say that together now? Our Father, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our sins. As we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. We might be relatively low in numbers of children during the summer, but we're certainly not low in numbers of people who need to know 
and practice more about prayer. Mm. Now guys, you'll come and lead us in our prayers before Margaret comes to share the first of our readings from the Bible. Continue our prayers. <clears throat> in Romans chapter 8, God speaks through his Apostle Paul to those who face hardship, persecution, doubt, or uncertainty. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says this And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Begin by, we begin by thanking God for his love and for the many, many ways in which he's blessed us. Loving Father God, we thank you for creating the world. Thank you for its beauty that we can enjoy and its resources which sustain us. Thank you for our families and friends, for relationships and shared experiences. And thank you for providing material blessings, those you've given us which we need to live, and also the, those which you've generously given us on top to enjoy and to share. Father, thank you that you are a loving God, always working for the good of those who love you. Thank you that we can be confident of your loving oversight and care, even when to us things feel confusing or uncertain, such as not getting a building, and the frustration of not being able to establish shall reach activities so we can grow gospel work here. Lord, we know that we will be able to look back one day and see you working out things for our good and the fulfilment of your gospel purposes. In the meantime, may we persevere in your service, patiently and with confident hope in you. Most of all, Lord, we thank you for the Lord Jesus, our Saviour, and for the certain promise of his future glorious return. Amen. Amen. We pray for the future of this church. Lord God, may Hope Church become established, well known for our love for you and for one another. May the church family be effective in your service. May we have opportunities to proclaim the gospel and grow disciples. We pray for Ben as he leads us and for each one of us as we serve you in our different roles as we are able, whether up front or behind the scenes, or faithfully persevering in prayer. Amen. Amen. We pray for our country. Father God, we know that winter will bring real financial hardship as food and energy costs rise. May our politicians focus on their God-given responsibilities to keep order and to care for the weak and the vulnerable members of our society. Please help us play our part paying our taxes and giving time or money directly where we see needs that we can help with personally. We pray for the government as they help the weak and vulnerable in other countries too. May they be generous with overseas aid and medicines, and generous with practical help and equipment for areas like Ukraine and Taiwan who are being bullied by evil aggressors. Finally, Lord, we thank you for Victor as he brings your word this morning. We pray that you guide him as he teaches and that you'll make us willing hearers and receivers of your transforming word. Amen. Amen. The first reading of the song is from 2 Samuel, chapter 15, verses 13 to 23. A messenger came and told David, the hearts of the people of Israel are with Absalom. Then David said to all his officials who were with him in Jerusalem, Come, we must flee, or none of us will escape from Absalom. We must leave immediately, or he will move quickly to overtake us, and bring ruin on us, and put the city to the sword. The king's officials answered him, Your servants are ready to do whatever our lord the king chooses. The king set out with his entire household following him, but he left ten concubines to take care of the palace. So the king set out with all the people following him, and they halted at the edge of the city. 
or his men marched past him, along with the Karathites and Palathites, and all 600 Gittites who had accompanied him from Gath marched before the king. The king said to Ittai, the Gittite, why should you come along with us? Go back and stay with King Absalom. You are a foreigner, an exile from your homeland. You came only yesterday, and today shall I make you wander about with us when I do not know where I am going? Go back and take your people with you. May the Lord show you kindness and faithfulness. But Ittai replied to the king, As surely as the Lord lives, and as my lord the king lives, wherever my lord the king may be, whether it means life or death, there will your servant be. David said to Ittai, Go ahead, march on. So Ittai, the Gittite, marched on with all his men and families that were with him. The whole countryside wept aloud, as all the people passed by. The king also crossed the Kidron Valley, and all the people moved on towards the wilderness. Now we just say, yet not I, but through Christ in me.
I'm the superman to come and see. <laughs> but I'm not. And uh, do you remember the Watergate scandal in America that set uh, President Nixon to resign? You may not agree with him politically. That's not what I'm trying to bring out here. But what happened to him, if you are in his position, was very humiliating. Today, he is the president of America. The next day, he's walking out. And everybody that we are around him left him. The journalists that want to know his view, they will all abandon him. The magazines and the newspapers that want his face on the pages of their newspapers, they wouldn't want him anymore. All of a sudden, he doesn't have the security of the biggest defense you can think of in the world. They abandon him. All the wealth and the uh, places that he can go on holiday will no longer be there for him. He lost everything. He left the White House. The psalm we are looking at today was written by King David when he was running away from his son, Absalom. Things were not working well for David because of what his son did. And I have three headings. The first is David's troubles. David's trouble. Absalom, David's son, led rebellion against him. And he didn't just do that, he succeeded in re recruiting many of David's former friends and associates. They all abandoned David and joined the ranks of those who troubled him. David's enemy was not just his son Absalom, but his friends. And that's why David said in verse 1 and 2 of the psalm, O Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. <clears throat> but that is not enough to go about to say that God has abandoned him. The fact that David was getting pain back because of his past sin. We know his history of what he did. So God was unwilling to come to his rescue. God was unwilling to come and rescue him. And they said there is no salvation for him in God. There is no hope for him in God. That's what they were saying. And the blessed life in Psalm 1 and the victory promise in Psalm 2 have eluded David. In Psalm 1, blessed are those, blessed are those. In Psalm 2, the victory. David have none. No blessed life, no victory. And it means that God can't help him. He is beyond repair. David is beyond repair. In 2 Samuel 16, that's not where we read today, you can read that at your covenant. Shime was an example of someone who said that God was against David and is just getting what he desired. And this was the most painful thought for David, thinking that God was against him. Charles Spurgeon said, If all the trials which come from heaven, all the temptations which are sent from hell and all the crosses which arise from the earth could be mixed and pressed together. They would not make a trial as terrible as that which is contained in this verse. It is the most bitter of all afflictions to be led to fear that there is no help for us in God. Why did David feel that way? Because David understood that God is all he needs. God is all he needs. And then, for example, in Africa, the, the investment parents make are on their children because there's no pension or gratuity or government support. And you can imagine if you've invested everything on your children, and when they grow up, they're turned out not to be responsible. They can't even take themselves, take care of themselves, let alone you. 
and you can see that the parents' hope are shattered. They will feel abandoned. That is exactly what they think about David. David has been abandoned. But praise God for what you have done already in this church. Hope Church. Things might not be as rosy as you would have hoped. Things might not be going as you think. You have not been abandoned. God is still in the business of holding the gospel and spreading the gospel in the northeast of England. It's, it's a risk that is worth taking of what you have done. But you need to know that God has not abandoned you. God is still with you. And David's response, David knowing that God is with him, that God has not abandoned him, is shown in David's response, which is in verse 3 and 4. So that takes me to my second heading, David's response to his troubles. But you, O oh Lord, verse 3 and 4, but you, O oh Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. David started verse 3 with but. But, which means, on the contrary, this means a contrast or opposition of what people are saying. Imagine hearing a bad story and you're holding your breath, what will happen? And all of a sudden you hear, but you would sigh, sigh of relief. David said, God has not abandoned me. I still have him on my side. And I will always have him on my side. So the first thing David did by recognizing that God has not abandoned him is to declare what God is to him. So the first one he says, God is a shield. Oh Lord, you are a shield about me. A shield. He declared that God is a shield to him. And remember, David is not calling God to be his shield. David is saying, God is my shield. So the greatest danger was facing, that David was facing, that wasn't just because so, his son has dethroned him, but more so they are saying that God has abandoned him. David knew that God was his shield, his protector, his covering, his shelter. He knows that and he believes it strongly. And in David's history, he must have seen it when he faced the lion, when he, he saw it, when Saul was against him, was after his life, and God protected him. For us, he is a shield for us, protecting us from the greatest danger we face in this world. And that greatest danger is the wrath of God. And he has shielded us from that greatest danger by sending Jesus Christ to take the consequences of our sin so that by believing in him, we will be shielded, we will be protected from eternal damnation. And the second description that David gave about God was my glory, the one who lifts my head, my glory. God was more than David's protection. He's also the one who puts David on a higher ground. Promotion to the powers as Israel king. Showing him his own glory. Well, people may find glory in all sorts of things. People may find glory in wealth. People may find glory in power, fame. People may find glory in beauty. And people may find glory in going on holidays where they have been on holidays. But David's glory was found in God. David's glory is in the salvation of God. 
in the very hope that God loves him and wants the very good thing for him, which is the salvation of his soul. So verse 4. I cried out to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. David said he cried out from the Lord, and, the, and God answered him from his holy, holy hill. David knows that his troubles are so many, and those that are after him are many and strong, but not too big for God to defeat. So he turned to God, and in contrast to what people think, God had him. And he said, he heard, him, he heard me, God heard me from his holy hill. <clears throat> Absalom pursued David out of Jerusalem, which is the capital. And the, Jerusalem is regarded as God's holy hill. But David knew that it wasn't Absalom that is enthroned on God's holy hill. He knows quite well who was there, that God himself, still hold that ground, not Absalom. And God himself would hear and help David from his holy hill. It is not Putin, Chinese president, Boris Johnson, or any of them that is coming, replacing him in September, or Joe Biden that is enthroned on that holy hill. It is our God. The one who loves us so much, the one who gave us Jesus Christ, that is enthroned on the, on, on the holy hill. And the assurance of knowing that God is enthroned on that holy hill, no one else. That is God that is in charge. That God that is in control. It's only God that is in control. So that takes me to my third heading, blessing from God and to God. Verse 5 and 6. I lay down and I slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. So David used both sleep and waking as evidence to describe God's blessing on his people. And due to the pressure that David was facing, because of the son's rebellion, Absalom, it will be obviously it will be difficult for David to sleep. But he slept. And it's not just sleeping, they're not even sure that whether David would, would wake up. But he, he wakes up. So God sustains us in our sleep. But we take it for granted. Think of it, you are asleep, unconscious, and dead to the world, yet you breathe. Your heart pumps. Your organs operate. Everything is still intact. And the same God that sustains us in our sleep, when we are dead to the world, would and will sustain us through our difficulties, through any difficulties we face. David said, he will not be afraid of 10,000 of people, of those that are against him. That confidence of not being afraid is not confidence in self or material things or the strength of David's army. It is confidence in God alone. David has a lot to be grateful to God for. God helped him to rescue his sheep. God helped him to defeat Goliath. God protected him against Saul. For us, God has been faithful to us. He saved us from eternal damnation, condemnation by sending Jesus Christ to die for us. And it's wonderful that we are called the children of Most High God. We have hope of eternal life. A place where we will spend eternity with him, away from the troubles and the difficulties and disagreements of this world. And more so, God has been faithful to Hope Church, to you. 
and he has been guiding you through this moment and he will continue to guide you into the future. It's him that is in trouble on the Holy Hill. You don't have a building of your own now, but God's guidance will take you through the future, into the future with all wisdom. God will guide you into very, every possible opportunity of gospel ministry around here. Our confidence should not come from the things we have, or positions, or money, wealth, intelligence, but from God. He is the only one that can offer us maximum security, maximum insurance. And remember, there is no excess to pay. Mm -hmm. You don't pay anything because Jesus Christ has paid it all. So he is the only one to hope on. God is the only one to trust. And because of that, David blesses God. Verse 7 and 8. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. David cried out, Arise, O Lord, not to strike my enemies, but because you have struck all my enemies. So David was thinking of both what his uh, what, well, of both what he's trusting God to do and what God has done. God has struck all his enemies. He broke their teeth. He broke the teeth of God, the meaning God has rendered them useless, powerless. The teeth that they had gnashed or sharpened against God's people shall be broken. When? At any time, the power of the, uh, of the church's enemy seems threatening. It is good to remember how often God has broken it. And we are sure that his arm is not too short. He can stop the mouth and he can tie their hands. So knowing what God has done gives David confidence in what the Lord will do. He has done it for us through Jesus Christ, and he will continue to do, to guide us. And finally, David declared, salvation belongs to the Lord, not to Absalom, not to Absalom or David's associates, but salvation belongs to the Lord. David understood that salvation, both in the ultimate and the immediate sense, was God's. David was not just thinking about himself, but he was also thinking about God's people. He wasn't just thinking about him getting back to his throne, but he was thinking about the Israel. The salvation belongs to the Lord, and the blessing of God be on his people. We live in a world full of problems and troubles. We have bad boss at work. We have unkind neighbors. We face loss of jobs. We have illness, disagreements in families. Disability wars everywhere. Bad governance, especially in Africa. But David, but like David, we need to understand that the only person to call upon is God. And he's the only one to cry to. Like David, he knew so well that God is faithful. We need to know that as well. He is faithful. He has shown us mercy. He has dealt with our greatest need. Just like my daughter did, knowing that her father is the only one to come to her rescue, we need to know that as well. We need to cry out to God. However you want to do it, in Africa, we don't do it gently. We do it loudly. Especially if you are in danger, if you are facing danger, you cry out to God. It doesn't matter how you did it. We've, we've seen so many pictures of, different pictures of how you can pray, both in the pitch, anywhere. Cry out to God. 
He is the only one that can answer. He is the only one that is faithful enough to come to your rescue. Cry out to him. But also remember that the danger, that, that the difficulties that we face, that Satan uses those to weaken us. But God allowed those weaknesses to strengthen our faith. Because the muscles of our faith need to be strengthened. And but remember that we are not to trust in our strength, but to continue to trust in God. So let's go through life with full dependence on God. Whether things are happening, whether good things are happening or unfortunate things are happening to us. Let's have this in mind. God is the only one to cry to. We have evidence, and that evidence is that he sent us Jesus Christ, who is our brother, our elder, and our senior brother. He loves us, and he's all the way with us. Let us pray. Father, we, we ask, Lord, that you help us. There are difficulties and challenges all around us. Sometimes we may not know where to start, how to write them down or articulate them. But that does not really matter. What matters is your faithfulness. Lord, Help us to always remember that you have our back. Help us to always remember that you are faithful. And help us to believe that even when things around us are not showing that, let us always remember that you love us. Thank you for Jesus Christ. And help us in the weeks and days ahead to trust and to love you, to serve you, go after you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for that picture. God is there when we call. Do we believe that? Yes. How do we know? Well, Jesus allows us to be certain of God's love for us and our hope in Him. Let's stand to say and remind ourselves and each other of that unique gift as we say in Christ alone. <laughs> Oh,
Please be seated. We've heard about God's word, we've heard about God's omnipotence, and we've heard about the ways that we connect with him. So in the coming week, assuming that we don't get stuck in the cave being chased by our children, how can we show our dependence on God? By reading his word, through which he delights to speak to us, and by showing our dependence on him, our communication to him in prayer. Those are the things that we have our resources this week. Not the only ones, but important ones. Because Jesus has hold of us. None of us can take, not no one can take us from his hand. And that really matters. I was with a member of the church family earlier this week. And knowing that he was in God's grip was so important to him. Not hanging on in his own strength, because it's going, but he knew that he was grasped by God. And as he was able to pray, he was invigorated. Let's respond to that wonderful salvation that we've been given by walking in truth and love to his glory. And let's join together in the words of our closing prayer. Send us out, Lord, in the power of your spirit. May the lips which have sung your praise always speak the truth. May the ears which have heard your word listen only to what is good. May the feet which have brought us together Walk in those good works prepared for us. For the glory of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You're most welcome to join us for tea and coffee afterwards. Thank you very much. <laughs>